So thank you to everybody for uh, coming along uh, and logging in today and joining us for this uh, CBI Scottish Power Joint Holyrood Hustings. Uh, this is the second or third of these sessions we've run uh, over previous elections as well. Obviously this time uh, we're having to do everything virtually, but we are really, really hopeful uh, that this will be just as insightful, uh, just as entertaining, and you never know, it might even be a, a wee bit feisty. So uh, we really, really do hope you uh, enjoy uh, what you're about to hear in terms of the debate. I would like to say, firstly, a, a massive thanks to all of the candidates. Uh, we're joined today by Kate Forbes, the SNP's Cabinet Secretary for Finance, for, uh, by Maurice Golding, the Scottish Conservative Shadow Cabinet Spokes uh, Secretary for the Economy, Fair Work and Culture, Daniel Johnson, who's Labour's finance spokesperson, Patrick Harvey, the co-leader of the Green Party, and Katie Gordon, who's the Liberal Democrat spokesperson for economy, uh, fair work and culture as well. Also, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure, we're joined today by Bernard Ponsonby, who, Bernard, STV special correspondent and you know, Scotland's foremost political broadcaster and journalist. And I'm sure, yet again, he will be fantastic at moderating uh, this debate uh, and again looking forward to, uh, uh, to listening to Bernard uh, do that uh, over the coming period of time. The debate today uh, is to focus on the economy and it's about how do we make sure the economy is at the heart of the election campaign but then also at the heart of Scotland's future in terms of growth, investment, jobs uh, and training opportunities. As we begin to recover from Covid I think everybody is starting to look at how do we get the economy back up and running Everybody's been talking about green economic recoveries and today hopefully we can put some of that into context and hear from each of the parties as to how they would do that, how they would deliver it and also just what they mean by it. At Scottish Power, it's of massive, massive interest to us. Uh, we're looking at speeding up investment in the future of renewables, in the network, the electrification of transport and heat and all of that is about delivering and driving us towards net zero by 2050 and on the back of it, creating a huge wave of jobs and training opportunities for people. And we're doing that and getting on with that with a £10 billion investment programme over the next five years, uh, which is a, a great thing for us. And hopefully, again, we'll be able to create a massive amount of change and new jobs in the economy as well. With COP26 coming to Glasgow this year, it puts an even bigger focus on the future of environmental issues and tackling climate change. And it also creates, again, a massive opportunity for everybody to be showcasing the work that's going on right across Scotland, as well as all of the work that's going on and the innovation that's going on within the city of Glasgow itself. I think there have been a lot of business reports and reports about the future of Scotland's economy that have come out over the, uh, the last four or five months. And I think um, my only criticism of any of them would be that they're really focused on the medium to long term and I'm as focused on and concerned about what happens over the next one to two years because it's over that period that we will need to create the jobs and the training opportunities for all of the youngsters who are coming out of school and university this year and next year. And it would be great to hear again uh, both medium, long and short and near term uh, parts to this debate today about the future of the economy. I think it then becomes incumbent upon uh, companies like ours uh, industry to start working with the new government and with the regulatory bodies to really get the economy up and running. And that's where it's also really important that the future of the economy and the future of business, it's not just about investments, it's about people's livelihood, it's about jobs, it's about training opportunities, it's about community and it's about localization and local spirit as well. Because business works at every level. It's not just huge big businesses like ours, it's local shops, local hairdressers, local news agents, and that makes it such a big and important part of the community and people's lives. So that's enough from me. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the debate, and now I'm going to hand you over to Bernard. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Keith, and a very warm welcome to the 150 uh, businesses across Scotland who are taking part in this virtual hustings, and also to a very warm welcome to members of the public who will be following the live stream either on Twitter or on the CBI uh, website. Just very, very briefly to take you through the structure of today, the questions are going to come in three distinct sections. The first section on questions which have already been pre-submitted. 
uh, a second section uh, which will last about 25 minutes when we'll be taking questions to the politicians uh, from some of Scotland's most senior journalists and then thirdly we'll have a section at the end for questions that you're submitting during the course of this debate. We'll choose a couple of questions to put uh, to our panellists. And uh, right at the end, we will reserve five minutes for each of the politicians to make a one-minute pitch about why you should support their party uh, in two weeks' time. So without further ado, let's go straight into questions which have already been submitted. And uh, the first question is, does Scotland have a party of business. That's the general theme and perhaps you could turn your attention to two sub uh, parts of that. Why do all parties seem much more comfortable talking about the value of the public sector as opposed to the private sector? And B, what is your direct message to businesses ahead of this election? So that's the theme of the first area of discussion. And can I first of all invite Maurice Golden of the Scottish Conservatives to answer that, given that Maurice was the first politician to log on, so he's been waiting patiently uh, to make his contribution. Maurice. Thanks. I thought you were going to me first because I've got the most credible message for uh, Scotland's business community, Bernard. Uh, ultimately, this election has to be about a recovery, and that means that the private sector are going to be a major component of leading that uh, recovery. We've heard from the hospitality sector describing the guidance from the Scottish Government as crippling. We've heard from the close contact service support sector that the guidance from the SNP Government is shameful. And that's why we led calls in the Scottish Parliament to establish a business advisory council so that the Scottish Government has to listen and work with business in order to develop policy both in the short term and the long term. I'd like to see that introduced because ultimately it's the private sector that is often vilified in the Scottish Parliament that provides the taxes that help us fund our NHS, our education sector as well. And that's critically important. Yvonne, I mean, there's quite a strong charge when you say that very often it's the private sector. The word that you used was vilified. Um, what do you have in mind? Well, wait till you come to Patrick Harvey. You might hear that. But there is a major uh, issue in the Scottish Parliament with people talking down the private sector as if they don't contribute to society, to communities and to our economy. And I think that's completely unfair, needs to be okay. challenged. And the Scottish Government must listen to business. Okay, well, Patrick Harvey did log on second, and so we're going to hear from the candidate of vilification, according to, to Morris uh, Golden. Morris, uh, Patrick Golden. Harvey, Patrick you know Harvey. what the question is, and you can respond to the charge. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Bernard. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Morris Golden's uh, argument is, um, is about as risible as, as a lot of what they say about us. Um, it's nice to be talked about, I suppose. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. Look, I'm, I'm just back uh, a few minutes back into the flat from visiting a local business. And uh, that's a, 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 like, a little microbrewery. They're looking forward to hospitality getting reopened. They set up uh, just a, a couple of months before lockdown started. So they immediately had to completely reinvent their entire business plan and, and adapt uh, to you know, not being able to, to sell to, to pubs and restaurants. Now they're looking forward forward to doing that. If you're asking, is there a party of business? I have no aspiration to uh, to sell to you the idea of the Scottish Green Party as a party of business as usual, right? That business as usual, the economy that we had before COVID, uh, that was the economy that created extraordinary levels of inequality and poverty in our society. That was an economy that even when it was growing, even when this narrow metric that everyone focuses on, GDP growth, was strong, you saw people unable to put food on the table. Now that to me is a failing economy. An economy that's growing but leaving people in food poverty, that's a failing economy. And it's an economy as well which is based on continual extraction and exploitation of nature, humanity is still conducting a war against the natural world. And it's a war we can only win by giving up. 
uh, and allowing nature uh, to restore itself. If we want to rebuild uh, a, a, an economy that is strong, yes, but an economy that's serving everybody's interests, an economy that lives within ecological limits, this moment is an historic opportunity. I genuinely believe we have an opportunity okay. on the scale of the generation after the Second World War, not just to say, let's get back to business as usual, okay. but to say, what kind of society do we want and how do we have an economy that serves got, that Got that, interest? Patrick, and we might come back to issues uh, like uh, emissions and environmental policy sort of later on and tease these out. Um, just to say to the politicians, if in terms of your answer you could aim for round about a minute in length, that will help us get through as many questions as possible and keep the thing flowing. Katie Gordon of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. So a party of business, I would say, is one that actually listens to businesses and doesn't go off and support Brexit, which is damaging for businesses, or independence, which is each, equally going to be damaging for businesses. So I think it's about thinking what, what do we need our business sector to do. Businesses, large businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, we talk to them all the time and we have a whole range of policies which are about supporting business to support our aims in terms of policy. So we want to move to a green, greener economy with green jobs, but we must have a just transition. You can't, as some other party say, you know, Put the whole of the oil and gas industry out of work for heaven's sake because you're focused on green economy you have to think about how do we transition people out of that and how do we support businesses to change towards being more focused on renewables so i think one of the things we do in the liberal democrats is we talk and we listen to business we think about how that could be uh, the advice and the public sector can support businesses to achieve the aims we want to achieve, but we don't have this simplistic public sector good, business bad, or even the other way around. It's about understanding what our businesses are about. It's about understanding how we can uh, ensure that the sectors that we want to grow can be supported to grow. It's about also thinking what do we mean by business success? So in terms of how we, how we judge that, it's not just about the bottom line. And it's not only about supporting businesses who are the, the big the growth providers. It's also about supporting those businesses that employ many, many people, but are struggling to transition or have struggled through COVID to help them become more resilient and to help them get through um, the time of COVID. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, Katie Gordon. Daniel Johnson from the Scottish Labour Party. Well, l l let me have my pitch for, for being the, the party of business. And I think in some ways, you know, I've got a strong claim. I, I come from a business background. I started my career in the corporate sector uh, for eight years prior to uh, uh, being elected into parliament. I ran a small business. So, I, I mean, I think I've got a good understanding of businesses, large and small. And, and more importantly, I understand the importance of, of business to the economy, but actually overall to society. And I think that's never been more true than the situation we find ourselves in now. We already see uh, uh, joblessness rising, so approaching uh, 5% and, and, and projected to increase above 7%. And, and Labour, quite simply, is going to be laser focused on, on ensuring that we do everything we can to protect jobs, because I think that's what's really at risk at the moment. We have been living through a health crisis but we're undoubtedly entering into an economic one. And in order to successfully navigate that, uh, politicians, parliament, government will have to work in partnership with business, both to support those initiatives, but also to recognise the very real challenges that business has ahead of it. Because I think we've had a lot of businesses that have got through to this point. They've seen off some of the, the profit and loss challenges, but they've been storing up issues on their balance sheet. And I think the next you know, one, two, three to five years is going to have to see real focus and support from government to see them through those issues so that in turn businesses can support retaining jobs and creating new jobs. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Kate Forbes. Thanks. Well, as a person responsible, well, was responsible for balancing the budget and prioritising limited resources, let me be crystal clear. There are no public services without a thriving economy. 
and without the many businesses represented on this call. We cannot invest in public services without investing in our, our economy and in the job creators. And so, yes, the SNP is a party for a thriving economy, for job creation, for greater levels of prosperity in Scotland. We've just been through a difficult year, as, as many have already uh, alluded to, and we've supported businesses uh, through that last year with just uh, approximately three billion pounds of investment uh, through grants and otherwise. You compare that to the investment in the health service, 3.2 billion pounds. So they're very similar. And that support needs to continue because we need to get the economy open and we need to get businesses back on their feet. We are the only party in the UK to have extended 100% rates relief for another full year with the lowest business rates poundage in the UK. Why? Well, because we want to give businesses as much headroom as possible to get their doors open and to uh, protect jobs. We've come through that period of survival. Now it's a period of recovery. So in direct answer to the question, what is my direct message to business? It's that economic recovery is going to have to be a national endeavour. As Keith said at the beginning, this is about livelihoods. This is about tackling poverty through job creation and job uh, protection. We've got to do things better. We've got to do things differently. And I certainly want to work in partnership with businesses to do that because our future is at stake if we don't. OK, I suspect that there'll be people watching this who are saying, I hear what they're saying. I absolutely hear the pitch, but I tune into the debates in the Scottish Parliament and I listen to debates which were always about the spending of money. But I don't listen to a lot of debates about what you do to create the wealth, which Kate Forbes has just said is absolutely vital if you're going to protect public services. So that leads us on to the second uh, question which has been submitted, which is that all of your manifestos contain a huge number of spending commitments. But what are your plans for growing the economy in order to pay for these particular promises. And let's sort of narrow it down just a little bit more pointedly. Uh, Maurice Golden, what is the one policy in the Scottish Conservative manifesto which is going to grow the Scottish economy? I think our plans to retrain to rebuild, um, providing £500 grants to allow people to have the skills to be able to contribute to our economy, Add to that the, the pledge to reduce business rates by at least 25% next year. Again, another business friendly policy. Also a business advisory council, which would indeed ensure that the needs and requirements of the business community are listened to. I also make the point in our manifesto, 21,000 words, 60 pages, with full costings attached so anyone out there can look at the appendix and see how the Scottish Conservatives would be able to not only support business not only uh, support the economy but also invest in our NHS in our education sector so again, and ensure some people will listen that we recover to that better from and the we'll pandemic. Say, this, is a, this is a politician who's going through a menu of policies which are essentially about spending. Investing in training, yes, that is money which government is going to put in. Investing in the NHS, yes, it's money that you're going to put in. The question is specifically, what are you going to do in the first place to generate wealth? Well, we'd like to create, make Scotland the e-commerce capital of Europe. We'd expand the Global Scot Network. Uh, we'd create a Scottish Exporting Institute. We'd expand our trade bodies with our major trading partner in England. And currently we only have one. And we need to ensure that Scottish businesses is helped and encouraged to grow. And that means expanding in, in the UK market as well as internationally. We'd also reform our economic development landscape as well to ensure that businesses get the support they need. There's tension now between the Scottish National Investment Bank and Scottish Enterprise. We've only seen two investments made by the Scottish National Investment Bank, but we'd also like to have a regional development agencies uh, to ensure that we get the right tailored local support for business to help them grow because they're okay, the thanks. experts at growing their business. Sometimes they just need a help or uh, ensure that we don't increase regulations during this time as well, which is also in the manifesto. And I think that's very important. OK, thanks for that. That's very, very clear. Uh, Kitty Gordon.
Well, um, I think it, it's a fair question, but I think the thing I would point out is that there is about, I think it's nine billion coming from the UK government for COVID recovery. So for probably the first time in a long time, there is actually significant money around for us to support COVID recovery. And that's why we're not planning on any significant tax rises or anything like that in this sort of immediate period, because unusually there is a significant amount of money available. Now, obviously, that is all going to have to be paid for eventually. But I think the point that is made internationally, nationally, and should be made in, in, in this instance as well, is that the Keynesian model of you need to invest at a point at which we're in significant crisis because investment is what allows growth to occur. So our, we have very specific plans about significant infrastructure investment, which will also support tackling the carbon, uh, the, the, the climate crisis. And the point about that is as you invest, and that's, it requires public sector investment to allow businesses to then feed off that. What we wouldn't be doing, for example, is is um, focusing on when we're when we're trying to support, uh, for example, renewables and building up our Scottish manufacturing to enable us to take advantage of that, then uh, ending up treating companies like Bifab so badly, where we end up saying, well, yes, you can bid with bunged in Scottish government money, but actually we're now going to provide the the appoint the contracts for abroad. So I think the point is you've got to make the whole thing coherent. Um, but but I think fundamentally, while we can talk about the detail of taxation, we want to reform business rates, we want a land value tax element, um, and we want to look at um, rates relief, but this is a specific point in time where there is major investment that's come from the UK government, quite a lot of that has not been spent by the SNP government yet, we need to use that for infrastructure which stimulates growth, which is allowing us to grow the economy. OK, I can see the Cabinet Secretary wincing at the suggestion that uh, not enough has been done, and we will come to her. But uh, Daniel Johnson, again, just to remind you specifically of the question, a policy which is, which is going to help grow the economy, to create wealth. Well, let me give you one policy and, and one broad theme. So uh, we have a, a commitment to uh, create a, a high street voucher who should put uh, money directly in the hands of uh, Scottish uh, consumers to spend on the high street because we, we recognise that consumer facing businesses have a huge challenge ahead of them. While they may have been able to reopen, they have been essentially accumulating debt. And I think that direct stimulus will help uh, kickstart the economy. But we also need a broad change in direction. And you know, I think you know, at the heart of that question is the, the sense that many businesses have that government is something that happens to them. It's not something that, that works with them. And I think that's been increasingly the case over recent years and we need to change that. So the other thing that we would do is completely refocus uh, business support agencies. And, you know, uh, and one key element of that is that we would repurpose Scottish Enterprise as a business recovery agency because we need to recognise the challenge that business has ahead of it. And we can't just simply keep on asking business to do things without offering a hand of help in return. Hello, Patrick. Yes. Would you like to say something like on the issue of a, a, a policy which will generate that? Well, I mean, this question has been framed in a number of different ways since the, the question itself was asked. Is it about wealth? Is it about growth? Is it about prosperity? And the Greens question whether these things all mean the same thing. You know, the, the idea of perpetual growth on a planet of finite resources can only be pursued while causing irreparable damage, both to human beings and to the, the rest of the living world around us. So when we ask ourselves, where does our future prosperity come from, uh, particularly as we move beyond the age of fossil fuels, and we have to do that, that's, that's a change that is, is coming and which only the Greens seem willing to, to face up to. We have to ask ourselves, what, what kind of economy do we want? How do we generate an economy that will meet everybody's basic needs? So obviously, renewables have a, a profound role to play in replacing uh, fossil fuels, and that has to be done rapidly. There are huge opportunities right happening right now with, uh, you know, fantastic 
tur uh, tidal turbine that's been built in Dundee, being installed in, in Scottish waters right now. That's the kind of opportunity for the future. And we, we need to avoid the same mistakes that successive governments made in relation to wind, uh, where we've not got the, the high value jobs uh, in, in wind that we could have had. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, as, as marine energy uh, matures and as it develops, we make sure that that's uh, an area that, that Scotland uh, can play a leading edge on. But the, the, the diversity of our economy, the diversity of our economy where we protect small and dependent businesses, instead of letting every sector from retail to hospitality to financial services get crowded out by a tiny number of vast businesses, if we, if we took a, a slogan like that horrible slogan a few years ago, take back control, uh, you know, and turn it on its head because it was uh, it was vested interests that took back control in the in the Brexit campaign. Let's take back control of our whole economy from the tiny number that stash the wealth we all create into tax havens, and actually make sure that we have the flourishing of a much larger number of small and medium sized businesses. That's the kind of economy that would actually keep wealth circulating uh, in Scotland and. Uh, it result in, in businesses that have their roots in local communities. OK, plans for growing the economy to pay for your promises. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would agree with the questioner that uh, when they're brave enough to tune into the Scottish Parliament, uh, the debates do feel like they're all about spend. And as the Finance Secretary, I'm usually the target of people's spending requests. So I certainly know more than most that there's never enough money to do everything that we want to do. I would, however, take issue with the premise that they are not mutually exclusive. Spend and raise is not are not mutually exclusive concepts. Um, and uh, Bernard, you asked for one policy. Can you forgive me for giving you two policies in terms of how we are going to uh, grow the economy? The first one is about the generation of young people that are coming through that we need to get into work. Their education's been disrupted, their university's been disrupted, and we need to get them into work. And our young person's guarantee guarantees them a job, an apprenticeship, or a training opportunity so that we don't miss out on that generation of people in work and contributing. The second policy would be continuing the delivery of the National Infrastructure Mission, substantial investment in infrastructure. Uh, our plan is to boost annual infrastructure by 1% of GDP by the end of the next parliament. That's about £33 billion in the next five years, 45,000 jobs in that period. What's that doing? Well, that is creating jobs. That is uh, making a, a supply chain more sustainable, creating opportunities for businesses to grow and then to contribute. Um, so, you know, to Katie's point about COVID consequentials, it's certainly nonsense that not all of it has been spent. Every penny of spend from that last year is publicly available. But we can't just depend on money flowing from the UK government. COVID consequentials were a one-off. You can't build a budget on one-off funding. It's unlikely to be repeated next year. So it is important that we are raising the revenue here in Scotland by investing intelligently in young people, in job creation, and in the businesses that will keep this economy moving. COVID consequentials there. Of course, uh, what the UK government does, does have an impact in Scotland in terms of consequentials. And given that the UK government, probably within the lifetime of the next Scottish Parliament, is going to have to address the issue of the deficit, which is in all likelihood going to lead to a squeeze on expenditure, Within the lifetime of the next Scottish Parliament, it is likely, therefore, that you are going to have to squeeze expenditure. And given I detect there is no enthusiasm from any of the Scottish parties for actually increasing the tax burden on the average worker, can you all, therefore, seriously give businesses who are tuning in here today a guarantee that they won't have to pay more tax when that squeeze through Barnett Consequentials comes. Kate Forbes, perhaps you could kick us off this time. Well, yes, we've set out in our manifesto that right now we believe stability is important when it comes to the tax regime. So as I said, look at what we've done this year. We are the only party to ensure 100% rates relief for the next year for retail, hospitality and leisure. In the UK, we have the lowest poundage. Now, you need to look at this, the, the tax powers that we actually have control over in Scotland. Income tax, council tax, eh, business rates are three main ones. Council tax has been frozen. I've just talked about business rates. And on income tax, um, we have talked about um, stability uh, and not increasing um, our, our, our rates. So, you know, 
I set out in January, the medium term financial strategy. It's one of those dull documents that not many people read, but it's worth reading. And it sets out the scenario. Sorry, I can see you speaking, but I can't actually hear you. I, I get the menu of policies there. We've all heard it. Um, it's all absolutely clear. I suppose the obvious question is that menu of policies actually sustainable for the lifetime of this parliament, given that you're likely to have a squeeze from the UK government on the block grant in the years to come? Well, I would agree with that. I think that's highly likely. We've already seen it in terms of our capital. So I talked about infrastructure investment a minute ago. Scottish National Investment Bank depends on financial transactions. It, this year, we've seen a 5% cut to our capital. And I think you're bang on. I think that it will be austerity 2.0. And our Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has said that austerity was the right approach. I think that's true. That is why our uh, costings have looked at the medium term financial strategy. And um, I can reassure you that although they're ambitious, they are affordable in light of what we know is coming down the track. Okay, um, I'm going to, Patrick Harvey has his hand up, so I'm going to go to, to Patrick Harvey to, to respond. Patrick. Look, I'm, I'm quite conscious that, uh, you know, the, the green uh, economic prospectus might not be what everybody in, in this particular audience wants to hear, but I, I hope I get a, at least a brownie point for being honest. I am not going to tell you uh, that the next session of the Scottish Parliament and the, the, the Scottish Government uh, will, ever, will, will never raise uh, a tax on business. And I don't think you should believe a word of it from any political party that says that that's a, a five-year promise. I just don't think it's realistic. But there is, right around the world, a case for a, an investment-led recovery. Even tepid centre-right politicians like Joe Biden in the US are looking at an investment-led recovery. And I think we need to place a clear expectation on the UK government uh, that we're not going to be left behind. We think that investment should be directed at renewable energy, at warm homes, at public transport and at restoring nature. And that those four pillars can create far more jobs than will be lost in the oil and gas sector, for example. But the, the idea that we're going to have another round of austerity, uh, that, we're, that we're going to fail to make the investments that we need. And I come back to this, this notion. Let's think of it like the recovery from the Second World War. That generation laid the foundations of a society that became steadily more successful and more equal. That's the scale of challenge before us. And it is going to take investment, uh, not doubling down on, on the austerity that we saw more okay. than a decade ago. OK, that's good. I'm going to come to, to Morris Golden now because uh, you heard what the Cabinet Secretary had to say um, in terms of spending plans. But of course, we do all know that the uh, decisions which Rishi Shunak will take do have a knock-on effect. Isn't it inevitable, given that he will try and draw down the deficit at some point, that whoever is in control of the next Scottish Parliament, the room for manoeuvre is going to be that bit more or less as a consequence of what Patrick Harvey was referring to there as austerity mark two? No, I don't detect any appetite for that. The, the bonds that have been taken out, which have funded much of the COVID crisis, are, are long term. And it's because of the broad shoulders of the UK government we've been able to borrow at such historically low interest rate levels. And I think the way out of this crisis is to ensure that our economy grows and therefore using increased tax revenues to pay back the, the, the debt that is there. There'll also be a review of the fiscal framework uh, later this year, which will determine how the Scottish Parliament receives funding from um, the UK government and, and that relationship. We've also seen forecasts from the Scottish Fiscal Commission that the economy um, should be recovering by 2024. That means we need to focus on that recovery for the duration of this Scottish Parliament. OK, Daniel Johnson, uh, you heard what Patrick Harvey had to say there, that he was prepared to be honest, that he could not say uh, that for the lifetime of the next Scottish Parliament that business might have to pay a bit more. He was being upfront and honest about that. Are you going to look business in the eye and say that Scottish Labour will not vote for any measure which will increase taxes on Scottish business in the lifetime of the next Scottish Parliament? No, I'm not, because I don't think we can be as simplistic as that. And, and indeed, in our manifesto, we talk about 
revising uh, or reviewing uh, non-domestic rates. And actually part of that explicitly we're saying that we have to acknowledge the huge growth in the online economy and, and we need to address that and tax that appropriately because the non-domestic rates regime was designed for a 20th century economy not a 21st century so I'm not going to do that because that's not what we're pledging to do but, but what I would say is that actually the, the steps we take now are really critical you know whether the UK government chooses to pursue austerity or not I think that would be a historic mistake uh, if you are to look at the lessons from uh, the response to the 2008 crash, but whether they do or not, the, the, the key to our success is restarting and recovering the economy here in Scotland successfully. So the, the decisions we take over the next uh, you know, 24 to 36 months will be absolutely crucial to that. So using the additional funds, I mean, it's, it's a, a little bit less than 10 billion pounds uh, as compared to the, the last pre-COVID uh, budget that we have, spending those, uh, as effectively as possible to restart the economy, to recover our public services is going to be critical. So we have to be laser focused on those decisions over the coming year or two. Okay, and finally, uh, in this section, before we move on to questions from journalists, uh, Katie Gordon, some reflections on, on what you've heard. Well, I think I'd refer to what I'd said earlier in that we are in an unusual situation because of COVID. Um, but we know that the point about investing to achieve growth is something where with the low interest rates that are available for UK government debt, this is the time to invest. This is the time to make those significant investments. But yes, there's going to be a review of the, the framework. And I think what we want to see also in advance of that is much more transparency about um, how much of the UK government spend has been directly spent, the COVID recovery, and to bear down on any efficiency, inefficiencies or any kind of underspends that exist, because we need to have the most efficient um, public uh, uh, spending plans for when the um, austerity inevitably hits. But one point I also would make is that one of the biggest hits to the economic growth and to the economy has actually and is going to be Brexit because that has been damaging to our economic growth and because of uh, the additional costs that's something we obviously don't have an ability to to change but it's something that's been imposed without us us uh, looking for it at all so we're having to deal with the consequences we will have to deal with the consequences if the Tory government ends up uh, moving towards austerity but I think the fundamental point about okay. using maximizing investment the investment funds that we get from the UK government to stimulate the economy is the way we would want to go okay about to move on to some questions now from from the media uh, one from Greg Cameron Scottish business editor of the Times um, uh, he can't uh, attend so I'm going to ask the question on his behalf before I come to Michael Blackley, the political editor of the Scottish Daily Mail. Greg Cameron's question is, how will you ensure the uncertainty over Scotland's constitutional future does not deter investors and hamper the economic recovery? Kate Forbes. Thanks. I mean, it's a, it's a good question because all of us are talking right now about economic recovery and all of us are talking in some way about changing the status quo. Some are talking about building back better. Some are talking about uh, tackling some of the structural inequalities. Either way, whatever we believe about Scotland's constitutional future, we're going to have to do things differently. We're going to have to see change. Either that's on the climate uh, side or it's because of the inequalities that have built up. Change is coming. The question is, how do we ensure that Scotland's economy is best placed to uh, deliver the potential of those opportunities? My view, of course, is that Austerity 2.0 will hinder economic growth in the way it did for the last decade, that being out of the EU against our wishes is directly harming, particularly small businesses that are trying to export or our, our, our well-known, renowned uh, food and drink industry. So. Yes, we've got a duty and a commitment to set out uh, the potential for the Scottish economy, but change is coming either way. There is no status quo to hang on to. And I think Scotland can do so much better, closely linked to uh, the rest of the world, yes, and um, building strong links with our, our closest friends and allies, but doing things differently with all the powers that we need here in Scotland. Okay, okay, just, just to tease this out ju just a little, 
Um, if all of the polls are correct and your party will have an outright majority in the Scottish Parliament on its own or if it is just short, a combination of your own party and other uh, pro-independence parties will get you over the 65 and there is a majority to hold a second independence referendum. Do you concede that that opens up the possibility of a constitutional crisis with the Westminster government and whatever the rights and wrongs of who's to blame for the standoff, you would have to concede that might just deter investors from taking decisions about where they spend their money. Well, there's a duty to ensure that we all honour the democratic mandate that will have been delivered by the people of this country. We recognise democracy. We believe that if the people of Scotland uh, vote to have a say over their future, then it is anti-democratic for the UK government to say no. It's not us that are manufacturing that crisis. It would be the UK government. And Morris Golden will come back on it. My question to you was, Whoever is to blame for the constitutional standoff, do you accept the mere fact that you have a standoff and a protracted political and constitutional argument might deter investors? Well, we have been clear. I understand your point that uh, protracted uh, negotiations and discussions mean that investors are waiting. But let's not do that. Let's be clear that we will honour democracy. And the question that has been posed to countless Conservative candidates over the last few days is if they are no longer Democrats, if they no longer believe that how people vote matters, they have become anti-democratic. This union is no longer based on consent. It is based on the force of law. And that will be entirely of the UK government's making. I hope they will think again and not be the anti-democrats that they're setting themselves up to be in this okay. election. Well, coming to Morris Golden on that specific point, if we take the Prime Minister at his word, and he is going to hold to the position, there will not be a second referendum, irrespective of what people say two weeks today, do you accept that a consequence of the Prime Minister not exceeding to a Section 30 order, that that protracted crisis, which we would then be in, could have the possibility of deterring businesses from investing in Scotland? I fully agree that the SNP's approach uh, on the Constitution is deterring uh, business, is not good for our economy, and indeed it's not good for our communities. Hatred and division need to be left in the, pla in the past. We had a referendum in 2014, a once in a generation referendum according to the SNP, and now they're even looking at holding a wildcat referendum. Some SNP politicians are saying later this year. It's absolutely appalling. It'll distract Parliament. It will make politics in Scotland with far more tribal. It will mean we can't harness the best from our parliamentarians. Uh, and we saw that from September in Parliament. Nicola Sturgeon ordered her troops to, to ramp up the hatred. And it was so difficult to get uh, things done. And I think so, sorry, so as a modern just, democracy, sorry, so we need just, to just, move sorry, Morris, forward, Morris, move, uh, move that behind. Uh, uh, Morris, uh, can, we, can, can we just tease out one point? You said there that the First Minister urged her troops, and I quote, this is what you said, ramp up the hatred. That's a pretty serious charge. How did she, to quote you, ramp up the hatred? Well, we saw it in the, in, in the chamber. It, the atmosphere completely changed from September. And, you know, some of the, the eyeballing that Mike Russell was doing to me and colleagues was, was, was awful. And it was really a, a, a terrible so, sorry, place how, to be. Uh, so, sorry, is political argument now conducted on the basis of how a minister, how a cabinet secretary looks at you, how a cabinet secretary eyeballs you? No, it shouldn't be. We should be discussing policies. We should be discussing how to improve Scotland. And that's what I want to do. And we can't do that with the backdrop of a second independence referendum. Daniel Johnson. Daniel? Sorry, apologies. My, my mouse was in the wrong place on my screen. I mean, I, in a sense, I despair. I mean, I think we've heard from 
both parties, uh, you know, so far, almost exactly kind of what the, 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 the problem is. I mean, Kate Forbes refuses to acknowledge the, the very real questions that, that, you know, more another independence referendum would pose. I mean, there's still unanswered questions around currency. And, and then we have Morris Golden accusing everyone else of tribalism when essentially, you know, the, uh, the whole, uh, you know, conservative you know, tactics over the last 12 months is to sort of I mean to goad uh, others, uh, you know, either for, for opposing them or, or not being unionist enough. And we need to move on. You know, Patrick Harvey, uh, you know, uh, uh, was really quite correct at the beginning of this, is we are facing a situation we haven't faced in, uh, really since 1945. Um, you know, we need to come together. We need to focus on that. And we really need to, to you know, move on from these uh, arguments of the past. You know, we can choose to focus on, you know, 50% of the country that agrees with us, or we can choose to focus on 100% of the country and taking forward, uh, you know, matters so that we can save jobs, restart the economy and rebuild public services. Now, I struggle to understand how reigniting these tribal divisions of the past helps us do that. I just don't. I think we need to move on. We need to focus on recovery. Okay. And that's the argument that Scottish Labour is making at this election. Katie Gordon. Well, there's a reason our slogan for the Liberal Democrats in this election is put recovery first, because it's fundamentally not about putting independence first. Of course, businesses are going to be affected um, in terms of whether they want to invest or not, when there's such massive un uncertainty. We only have to look at how business investment was reduced or held back in the run-up to the EU referendum and then in the run-up to Brexit actually happening. Businesses are struggling to cope with that as it is. We know whole sectors that are finding that really difficult. But we also know the massive amount of investment um, and joint working between England and Scotland. So if we're going to put that at risk, and you've got companies that are both sides of the border thinking, well, what is the prospectus this time compared to last time? Of course, they're going to delay investment. It's one of the most damaging things that's going to have an impact on the economy, as Brexit has been. So our view is, can we just put that aside? The responses we get on doorsteps all the time, even from SNP voters, is now is not the time. Let's put it aside and let's get on with focusing on recovering from COVID. And that is fundamentally by voting for parties like the Liberal Democrats who do not want to go into a yet another constitutional <laughs> argument. Patrick Harvey, I see you chuckling about that. Patrick. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this discussion, I, I, I would be tearing my hair out if I had any. Um, you know, for, for Morris Golden to accuse others of being divisive when, you know, they've, they've spent months throwing around words like corruption and, and demanding people sacking before they've even heard evidence about, uh, you know, the issues around the code of conduct and so on, at the same time as supporting uh, every misdeed of the UK government. Uh, and, and now, you know, I don't like the way Mike Russell looked at me in the chamber. I mean, come on. And I, I absolutely f understand and, and empathise with Daniel Johnson's frustration about saying, you know, we need to see, you know, our whole community, not just uh, speak to one side or other of the constitutional divide, but honestly, saying to the half of the country, by many polls, more than half of the country, that there is no democratic path to your political objectives, that is that is specifically only speaking to people who agree with you that there shouldn't be a referendum. You know, it, it, I, I realise it's frustrating, uh, but you, if, if, if we're going to say to people that there is no democratic path to doing that, that you can't have it with a Section 30 order and you can't have it without a Section 30 order. You're just not allowed to decide. That is not a way to, for, for a democracy to resolve these issues. And I, I, I don't see uh, any evidence that there was a, any great negative impact on the economy from 2014. I do see that in relation to 2016, both in the anxiety before it and in the reality of what's happened after the Brexit referendum. But I don't think the evidence shows that that happened uh, in 2014. Not everybody enjoyed it. I get that. Not everybody thought it was a, a, an engaging, I thought it was an engaging event. I thought it brought a huge amount of new energy into our politics. But I don't see objective evidence that it was economically harmful to have the debate. And if we're going to be debating, how do we have a recovery from COVID? Surely we should be debating that 
with the widest range of options on the table and ultimately okay. leaving it to the people okay. of Scotland to decide. Uh, let's go to Michael Blackley, political editor of the Scottish Daily Mail, uh, to ask the next question. Michael. Hi, thank you, Bernard. Uh, good afternoon, panel. I'd like to pick up, there was a point in the last section of the debate when Maurice Golden said that he referred to the projection that it could take four years for the economy to recover from coronavirus. Um, so I'd like to ask the panel if they agree that we could be in for this sort of battle against coronavirus that could ultimately take up much of the next term of parliament. And if that is the case, can an independence referendum happen during that recovery phase? Uh, Morris Golden. Well, no would be my answer uh, for a host of, uh, of different reasons, but it was the Scottish Fiscal Commission that's that stated that it will be uh, likely to be 2024. And as you say, Michael, that uh, is going to engulf the majority of the next parliament. And that's why we're urging everyone at the polls to, to end division, to say no to a second referendum, rebuild Scotland by voting both votes for the Scottish Conservatives. OK, Kate Forbes, um, if it does take to 2024 for full recovery, there won't be a referendum in that timescale because the First Minister has made it perfectly clear that whilst we're in the recovery phase, there won't be a referendum. So if it does take to 2024, there won't be a referendum. Well, that's not quite precisely what she said, but in terms of the uh, initial premise of uh, Michael's question around the impact I think there will be a long term impact on the economy, but I think it's because of the way in which the economy will recover. So economists started by talking about a V-shaped economy, a V-shaped recovery, we'd bounce back. And then it was a W-shaped. Now it's a K-shaped. And that reflects the fact that some businesses, some sectors have actually done really well during the, the pandemic. If you think of the tech sector, you think of other sectors, they've done well. Other businesses have struggled, but they will bounce back. There are other sectors, however, that I think will not bounce back and their sectors have changed uh, irrecover um, irrecover like I'm not going to say that word, uh, without recovery. Take the high street, for example, businesses on our high street. I think uh, the way in which we shop, behavioural change, will see some businesses having to change forever in order to recover. So in terms of economic impacts, I think we'll see economic impacts for a very long time to come. Some sectors are doing well, some sectors will have to change. What Nicola Sturgeon has said is that after the immediate impact has passed, in other words, once we start to uh, relax lockdown restrictions, we're back to as much normality as possible. But before uh, recovery in airness, which allows us to shape that recovery, I do not want austerity 2.0 to be undermining our economic recovery, to be undermining our economic growth, and to be undermining job creation, which is precisely what it has done under the Conservatives since 2010. OK, Daniel Johnson. So, I mean, we need to look at the analogues and precursors for this. So, uh, I mean, I think many people would still argue that we're still living with uh, many of the effects of the 2008 financial crash. In terms of post-war recovery, rationing was with us until 1954. You know, these are the sorts of timeframes that you look at in terms of uh, recovery. And, and, I, and I, 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 I simply say that I think it is not possible to fully engage with that if you have uh, you know, constitutional uh, you know, division and, and indeed the, just the process uh, happening. It will, that will take years. We know what happened last time. It, it sucked the political oxygen uh, from Scottish uh, politics. And more importantly, you know, some of Kate Forbes' answers just don't even stack up with what her party has said previously. We know what the, the Growth Commission said, was that, 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 that public spending would be held below economic growth. Now, if we're saying that we can't have austerity 2.0, well, that sort of approach is just completely incompatible with what she's saying. So, look, I, I think we have to... Uh, let the recovery take hold. We have to recognise that recovery is going to be multifaceted. It can't just be limited to purely infection control. It has to take in, in, into consideration social and economic. So that's why we say at the very least for this next parliamentary term, we need to focus on that, focus on that central uh, issue that, that 
clearly is important to all of us, which is recovery, and, and set these other arguments to one side. Katie Gordon. Well, I guess it depends what you mean by recovery. I mean, I'm kind of surprised when listening to uh, definitions of the recovery just means infection control and we're we're loosening up and, and coming out of lockdown. And I think if you look at the impact on uh, young people who are in education and have lost a whole year, um, how long is that going to take to catch up? There's an awful lot of work needs to be done. You look at the impact on health and the amount of people who've got long COVID or other people who've had their operations delayed because of because of the COVID situation. And that's going to take a heck of a long time and will also probably increase the costs for health in the longer term. You look at the impact on jobs of businesses that have gone to the wall or businesses that or or people that have lost their jobs and not going to be able to come back. These are not short term issues. These are not things that can be resolved in a quick fix way. And I recognise that in a political environment, it's always about let's talk short term, let's talk up until the next election. But I work in a background of higher education where we're looking at several years hence all the time. It is not possible to say we are going to be out of this and able to distract ourselves by talk about referendums and we know how long it took last time. One thing I would give credit to when we had the last referendum in Scotland is it took was it two to three years of discussion and that is something that's going to take an awful long time and a lot of distraction and it, it stopped all the political conversation about other aspects of what we need to do. So the putting recovery first is a genuine long-term thing we need to do. I don't think we can do both at the same time. So I would welcome support for putting it to one side and thinking, well, not in this parliament at the very least. And yes, of course, there's democracy. Will there be democracy at the election after that? But I think this one is fundamentally about we've got to put our recovery first and not be distracted by this. OK, Patrick Harvey. Yeah, I mean, we, we are a democracy now. I, I don't think anyone can say you, you can have your democracy in five years time. There, there is a there is a democratic principle in, involved here right now. You know, clearly, we have to hope that we'll be out of the immediate public health emergency uh, before too long. And if we're committed internationalists, we should be looking to contribute to programmes to make sure that the whole world is vaccinated and that the whole world can emerge from the public health emergency this year or early next year. But yes, the, the, the longer term economic and social recovery phase uh, is going to take a long time. Uh, and in that challenge, the question of whether we face that recovery best uh, as an independent member of the European Union or as part of Boris Johnson's Brexit Britain, that remains an open question. There'll be people in this audience with a wide range of views on that question. There are people throughout our society with a wide range of views about that question. But the idea that we're just not allowed to debate it yet, that we're not allowed to make that decision, uh, clearly the only people with a right to decide which of those two dominant paths our country might take are the public. Boris Johnson doesn't have a right to say we can't make that decision. Douglas Ross doesn't have a right to make that decision, uh, to say we can't make that decision. The people of Scotland have a right to choose whether they are ready to face that question again in a referendum. And the way they choose is whether they elect a pro-independence majority in Parliament. OK, um, I think we sort of, at one or two points, perhaps strayed off Michael's question. I want to go back to Michael Blackley of the Scottish Daily Mail and see if he wants to maybe put a supplementary, maybe to one member of the panel, because I'm conscious that we're not going to have time to go around um, everybody. Uh, Michael, you want to make an observation? Um, yeah, just as a follow-up to that, um, while, we, while there's years ahead, potentially before the economy recovers, I'd, I'd be interested in maybe asking uh, Kate Forbes, um, how long can you promise that uh, business rates relief can continue for the worst affected businesses, um, those in hospitality and leisure and retail, for example? Thanks. Um, so it's a good question, and I, I'm sure you'll uh, publish the fact that we are the only part of the UK to uh, implement 100% rates relief for the next uh, year. I think we need to review that at the next budget, because the reason for extending it for a year is to give businesses that bit of headroom to help them protect jobs and to invest in reopening. As I said, some businesses are probably going to bounce back 
easier than others. And I think at the next budget, it will be whoever was in my shoes last year to look at how we ensure our rates relief uh, support uh, the businesses that are struggling the most. Obviously, we've got other reliefs in place. The, the small business bonus scheme, which ensures that uh, all small businesses don't pay, relief, pay rates. So those reliefs will continue for the duration of the next parliament. But others in terms of the COVID rates relief will need to be reviewed uh, at the next budget. OK, that is absolutely clear. Uh, can I now move to Scott Wright, Deputy Business Editor for the Herald, uh, for his question. Scott. Uh, thank you, Bernard, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, could I please ask what plans do the parties have to, to rejuvenate our towns and city centres, which have been so badly affected by the decline of the retail sector and also the huge shift um, um, to working from home, which looks set to, to continue in some respect in the future. Daniel Johnson, can we uh, put that to you uh, as somebody who indeed managed a lot of shops? Indeed. I mean, this is an issue that's very close to my heart. And I, and I, and I think whatever we say, and I'd acknowledge what, what Kate said earlier, that there are, there are certain you know, types of business who are not going to bounce back and, and, and I think many on the high street that that may be the case but I think we need to give them every opportunity to do so so as I've already set out we are proposing a, a creating a high street voucher scheme which would give everyone uh, you uh, directly a, a voucher to spend on the local high street uh, that's in line with what uh, has already happened in Jersey and has been proposed by the Resolution Foundation on top of that, I mean, I think we do need to look at non-domestic rates. I think that the balance is, is out of kilter and we do need to look at, at ways that we can tax more fairly uh, online uh, sales. So that's that's sort of the core proposals that we have. But my overarching observation is also this, is that I think there's a lot of talk about what we do with the high streets. And what is really critical is that high streets are maintained as, as a, a focus and centre for economic activity. I think sometimes this discussion goes into territory whereby, you know, essentially the, the, the high street is just allowed to, to drift into something else, you know, leisure and, and recreation. What's really critical is, is both geographically but also economically that those places close to people's homes are also places where people can, can work and spend money and that we maintain that focus. So I think we, we, we really need to have that focus and sometimes I think we've lost that. Uh, in recent years when we've been talking about how to re renew and regenerate town centres. Thanks very much. Uh, Morris Golden, I think when I first met you, you were a candidate in the Glen Rothes by-election in 2008, and I, I recall then even the issue of the high street dying off was a, was a live issue then. Here we are, 13 years later, still talking about it. What can the Conservatives do about it? You don't look a day older either, Bernard. Um, <laughs> I, th I think there's there's a lot of work we need to do. I think um, non-domestic rates, um, reductions uh, on an ongoing basis, as well as linking a business rates review, because as has been mentioned previously uh, on this panel, the business rate system is no longer fit for purpose for our modern economy, so we need to review that. Some basic... Um, uh, uh, planning regulation changes to make it easier, for example, for businesses to expand out onto the pavements, uh, car parking charges, council car parking charges being removed will also help, uh, as well as um, having you know, a more positive vision about how we attract people and have an offering um, that is going to draw people to the high streets. You know, I run a, a grocery store as part of my family business, but you know, when Tesco opened up 500 yards down the road, it made it very difficult to compete. And I'm sure many businesses out there are in a similar scenario. But I'm, I'm encouraged, actually, to see more and more green grocers opening up, um, other uh, cafes. And I think we, we, we need to give those businesses support and support the entrepreneurs uh, in order to have as vibrant a high street as we possibly can. Patrick Harvey. Well, I mean, finally, uh, a point of agreement uh, with, with Morris. Uh, the, the support for, for the independent businesses is, is something that I hope every political party uh, agrees in. And they, they are uh, suffering unfair competition from uh, the, the, the big giants, whether it's the, the massive retailers, whether it's the, uh, 
the, the, the big box companies that uh, very often use tax havens to extract their profits and uh, minimise their, their contribution to the public purse, or indeed the online retailers. And we, we need a, a way of bringing those into the, uh, the, the tax base as well. But the way that we use uh, our urban environment is clearly going to change. I think it was already changing and COVID is accelerating it. Uh, and as more and more people you know, probably won't work from home full time as they did during the, the, the lockdown, but more and more people working in a hybrid way, working from home part of the time, working remotely in different ways, we are clearly at risk of seeing buildings going underused and falling into dereliction. Land value capture uh, would be a really important tool. And if we had a system of, of that, whether through land value tax or anything else, uh, to if we had that already, we'd be in a better place to, to prevent that from happening. We probably need to look at more uh, residential use of towns and, and cities, uh, rather than thinking that there are residential areas here and commercial areas there. Uh, and uh, certainly the, the, the idea that we that we try and make it easier to bring even more traffic into the urban environment, that's that's got to go. That has to go. If we want our urban environment to be attractive, healthy and safe for people to spend time in, if, if people are going to be attracted to go in there rather than staying at home and, and you know, buying everything online, we really need to do what some of the, the more progressive countries have done and look at pedestrian space, look at uh, car free spaces, look at the, the causes of, of pollution, make sure that our, our towns and our urban environment uh, is safe and easy to, to walk and cycle about uh, and, and particularly safe for those with, with mobility problems. So um, again, this is an incredible challenge, but it's also an opportunity to rethink how we use urban space uh, and in whose interests does economic activity take place. Okay, Katie Gordon. So one of the things I think we really need to do is to devolve and decentralize the um, enterprise advice and support um, so that it's not a one size fits all, so that if we give local authorities more powers to reshape their city and town centres, but working with chambers of commerce, working with the enterprise agencies to try and ensure what is right for one, say, small town to another sort of more rural area to a big city is actually going to fit. Um, fundamentally, yes, of course, we want to um, reform business rates. Many people have talked about that not being um, fit for purpose now. But it's it's crucial that we look at the burden on high street retailers compared to online. We know we've all spent the whole of the past year shifting to online. And the key question is, what will come back? When we've seen the opening up, there have been big queues at uh, shops across the country when, when they started opening up in, in England. So there is some demand to come back, but also other things we have learned to go online. So we need to make sure that the, the cost structure for businesses is such that they can survive. And that's a really urgent thing. Thinking it is really important that we look at a land value element and I mentioned that before because that's about helping high streets develop as community hubs by ensuring that we are um, tackling those that land banking where you've got empty properties or businesses that uh, uh, sites that are not being used because of the way things are taxed. One other thing I would say is that Liberal Democrats, we're very supportive of this kind of concept of a 20 minute neighbourhood, the kind of the ability to sort of walk or uh, cycle to so many things in your local area. That's about having a much bigger, uh, broader range of services and including public services. And it hasn't helped when, you know, police stations and courts and things have been closed over the last few years because they are part of an active town centre. So it's about looking at how can we shape that mix to ensure that people still want to go into the towns. We support businesses so that they can survive compared to online. And we ensure that the infrastructure, so, you know, investing in public toilets, for example, we've all found that's been pretty challenging when shops are shut in the past year. So investing in the kind of capital infrastructure that can help, but also thinking about active travel, making it easier to get into the town centres. I think there's a whole mix of things we can do there to ensure that we do stimulate and come out better. Cabinet Secretary. Thanks. Well, I think this is a good example of my point at the outset around uh, the need for a national endeavour, because when it comes to town centres, there were obviously challenges prior to the pandemic. Those have only been accelerated during the pandemic and government certainly does not have a monopoly on the solutions to these structural issues. It's one of the reasons that we uh, pulled together the, the town centre uh, 
task force that have published now in the town centre action plan. You'll be delighted to know with lots of representatives from outside government to look at this core issue. I think from my way of thinking, there's three quick uh, solutions. One is direct investment. So this is the second year where we've had uh, the town uh, centre fund, uh, £50 million pounds this year, £50 million pounds, uh, last year for local solutions. So the issues facing a town centre in my neck of the woods in somewhere like Dingwall or in Portree, it's very different from uh, some of the villages on the outskirts of Glasgow, for example. So local solutions. Secondly, taxation. So there are already supports in place in terms of the small business bonus uh, scheme that means that no small businesses pay uh, tax to allow them to invest in other things. Uh, but we also need to look, and we've put that through our budget this year, look at how we deal with the particular impacts of the pandemic. So lots of empty buildings. And that's where the fresh start scheme that reduces your rates liability for the first 12 months, if you occupy a, an empty building, it will help. Lastly and briefly is on levelling the playing field, which others have mentioned. And perhaps this is an area of cross party consensus because it is an area of, of national uh, crisis, as it were, that we do need to level the playing field. We've said in our manifesto that we will look seriously at a digital transactions tax to, in order to level the playing field, because you could have a small tech business in a broom cupboard uh, making substantial profits whilst a large, perhaps manufacturing uh, plant um, is paying a lot more in tax, but not seeing the same uh, turnover or profit. So for Scotland, it's difficult to uh, create a new national tax. So it is somewhere that we probably have to work quite closely with the UK government, but we've certainly committed to looking at that seriously. And uh, that could be part of the non-domestic rate system or sit separately to it. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, I just want to briefly go back to Scott Wright to see if he's got any observations on that or perhaps would uh, like to put a supplementary to, to, to one member of the panel because again we're, we're a bit short. Yeah, th thanks Bernard. Um, I mean, there's obviously a lot of talk about um, the business rates regime and how it's no longer for fit for purpose. I mean I'd be interested to see perhaps Daniel have any particular ideas of what direction that, that um, business rates could go in, in the future. I mean could it be scrapped altogether with something different for example? Daniel? Oh, sorry, that was my mute button again. Um, I, I mean, I think it needs to. I, mean, I think it needs root and branch review. I mean, we had a sort of a, a, you know, a partial review uh, in the last parliament. But I mean, I think looking at the basis upon what you tax and, and how that tax falls is really important. Uh, and the moment, it, it, it essentially, it's based on a very crude analogue of, of what rent is charged, and that. Uh, although some sectors it's, it's even sort of more bizarre uh, formulations than that. I, I think we really need to, to look at it as a whole. I think that would need to be put out to uh, a, an expert uh, group uh, to, to look at that. But I think it, it needs to be uh, broadly stated and, and probably uh, replaced in its entirety. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to give you the opportunity to uh, make a pitch for one minute and why people should uh, vote for your party. But before we do that, uh, I want to see if we can, we'll certainly fit in one question, perhaps two if your answers are brief, in terms of questions which have been uh, submitted from the businesses which have uh, joined us for this afternoon's uh, hustings. And so from the question is from Andrew Morrison of MCC Accountants. Scottish Government figures published last month show 78% of Scots work in the private sector versus 82% elsewhere in the UK. With remote working more commonplace post-pandemic, what will the candidates do to encourage such jobs from areas like London and the South East to relocate to Scotland? And I'm going to ask you to be as brief as you possibly can in order that we can get another question. And let's go to Patrick Harvey on this one. Patrick. Patrick. I think fundamentally Scotland's attractiveness to, to people and to businesses to move here is about quality of life uh, and that involves uh, partly uh, you know, our natural environment and, and protecting that but it also involves a social contract, what, what's been described as a social contract. You know, the, the idea that we, uh, that we replicate the, the same kind of policies as, as UK where you, you have to pay to access public services like education, uh, where uh, wealthy people get the, the biggest tax breaks. I, I think that would undermine the things that make Scotland an attractive uh, and a rewarding place to live. And I, I meet people all the time who've moved here uh, and who don't buy the, the, this race to the bottom agenda that you have to 
uh, copy UK policies in order to make Scotland an attractive place to live and work. Okay, Morris okay. Golden, perhaps Morris more Golden. flexibility in the labour market, perhaps opening up the possibility of separate visas for Scotland, changes to the immigration system to attract people to come here? I think there's a, a real opportunity here with remote working and I think opening up the London jobs market in particular um, to Scottish workers is a real opportunity because you know the the numbers there really offer um, um, lots for Scottish workers. What we need to do is ensure that um, Scottish wo workers are trained, have the right skills, uh, and are able to access these jobs. But you know, um, I'm picking up from the job market that increasingly um, uh, employers are willing to do remote working with perhaps you know one trip into the office um, every week or every fortnight, and I think that's a that's a massive benefit. It doesn't stop us creating jobs here and yeah, directly here in Scotland as well. But I think opening up the possibilities for people is something that's very positive, and I think we should all agree on that. Okay, Daniel Johnson. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, the, I think this is an important question, but it also is very contingent on having the right infrastructure in place. And you know, fundamentally, we need to make sure that we have the the best broadband we can. If that's actually going to be a possibility. But secondly, we also need to ensure that the things that are attractive here remain so. I mean, the, 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 the premise of the question is that it's, sort of, it's cheaper and better to, to, to live up here. The cost of living in Edinburgh is increasing you know, quite dramatically. So unless we do things you know, such as fixing the housing crisis in Edinburgh, some of those premises that lie behind that question will quite disappear. So we, you know, it's infrastructure and investment will be what enables that to happen. Okay, Katie Gordon. You've stolen my best line there, Daniel. I was going to talk very much about digital connectivity because, frankly, how can you run a business from home if you can't actually get the download speed that's going to allow you to do that? So that has been so delayed for so long, and we absolutely need to make sure that this time the most rural um, locations are not yet again at the back of the queue. So it's about ensuring digital connectivity across the whole country, which we want to have digital connectivity managers locally based to ensure that you can, you can ensure that this is driven. And I don't think it should be just a monopoly provider that supports that. But I think the other thing is about support for business growth, for business startup, and for business maintaining your business and transitioning to the green economy. So I think I've referred to that that earlier. In the, the interest of brevity, I think what I would say okay. is it's fundamental digital connectivity and support for business uh, growth and maintenance. Great, Kate Forbes. Thanks. The direct answer to your question is a big investment and a big focus on uh, supporting the job creators in the private sector. Now, our manifesto has a big focus on entrepreneurship, but also on the economies of the future. And if I pick just one area, it would be on tech. So uh, Mark Logan, um, formerly of Skyscanner, uh, produced the blueprint for how the Scottish economy can stand out when it comes to tech. And we saw just in the few uh, months before uh, the pandemic struck, a number of big global businesses choosing to set up their tech hubs in Scotland, Glasgow and Edinburgh and elsewhere, because they knew there was a pipeline of talent there and they wanted to locate here. Now, if we can build on those foundation stones and be seen as the pro-entrepreneur pro job creators here in Scotland when it comes to the economies of the future then I think we've got huge uh, potential and opportunities. Last plug though for the Highlands and Islands which is we don't want our entrepreneurs to stop in the central belt we want them to go further north too which is why the Rural Entrepreneur Fund in our manifesto is so important. Thanks. Okay I want to squeeze in one last question before you all make your one minute pitch and the final question of the day. Uh, from Ben Walker of Scottish Renewables. Recognising how essential renewable energy is to Scotland's economic future and fulfilling our transition to a net zero society, if your party forms the next government, will you, uh, will you, it, I can't, for, I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's very literate, but I think we get the meaning of it. What are you going to do about getting to net zero? Uh, Kate Forbes. Well, we've got tough statutory targets. We'll only get there if we do some tough 
things and we can't do it on our own. We can't do it solely with public sector investment. So we've put in place a two billion pound fund for investing in green infrastructure, as it were, alongside a hundred million pounds in our green jobs fund so that in building the infrastructure, we also have the jobs to go with it but we need to partner with private sector investors uh, to see that transformation we can do that through the scottish national investment bank um, and there's some obvious places to start like the supply chain for the scotwind uh, uh, bids morris golden well the next scottish government's got a massive problem on their hands about achieving net zero the the smp have failed their last to meet their last two legal emissions targets. They failed to meet the renewable heat targets, their biodiversity targets with one in nine species facing extinction. They failed to publish a wildlife management strategy. They failed to meet their 2013 recycling target. Meanwhile, encouraging incineration, which is up by 400%, making Scotland the ashtray of Europe. What we would do about it, we'd introduce a circular economy bill We'd have some major interesting infrastructure projects in the, there, such as an electric arc furnace, a plastic recycling plant, because currently only 2% of plastics collected for recycling in Scotland are recycled in Scotland. We need to change that. We'd have a circular economy centre for excellence, a textile strategy to stop about 50% of our textiles going into landfill, as well as one third of microplastics from ocean is from textiles as well. Uh, we'd re-enforce uh, our public procurement for around circular economy and we'd introduce a nature bill uh, to incorporate a whole range of ways in which we avert the biodiversity crisis that the SNP okay. have thrust upon Scotland. Great. Katie Gordon. My goodness, there's a lot I could say, but in the interest of brevity again, we need not just targets, but a specific route map for every sector, costed, funded and realistic. We know heating and transport are the biggest polluters. We need to bear down on both of those. That's about retrofitting homes, huge programme about that and making sure new homes are, are built to the right standard. And we need to tackle the polluting transport and shift to public transport into active travel. Um, I think the, the other areas we need to do, tackling um, the climate emergency, by declaring a nature emergency. I could go on, promise you I won't. That's my pitch. <laughs> Daniel Johnson. So, I mean, I think this is a good area which exemplifies that the approach to, to, to uh, 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 the recovery isn't about necessarily doing things radically differently. I think it's about bringing forward things that would be the right things to do anyway. So, for example, uh, Scottish Labour has a, a commitment to upgrading every home to energy uh, category C or above. That would mean upgrading around 80,000 uh, homes a year. That would create almost 20,000 uh, uh, jobs. So you, you tackle the jobs crisis, you tackle the climate crisis. It's, you know, I, th I think the way we recover is about actually accelerating forward, whether that's in the digital economy, where it's just transition. And I think that's the approach that we need to take. Patrick Harvey. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously sorry that this has come right at the end of the discussion because COVID is a profound challenge, uh, but this, the climate and nature emergencies, is a far, far bigger one, and it's going to be a far longer term challenge as well. Every challenge, as I say, is an opportunity. And as I said earlier, you know, things like the tidal energy industry, we need to be making sure that we don't lose out on that in the way that we lost out with wind. The green uh, economic recovery program that we're setting out is on renewable energy, public transport, warm homes uh, and nature recovery. And we believe that all of these are capable of creating high quality jobs of the future. But, you know, fundamentally, I really welcome the fact that everybody's now using rhetoric like climate emergency, just transition, net zero. But so far in terms of action, they are all trying to have their cake and eat it. They're all trying to say you can have a just transition while still going looking for ever more fossil fuels. Ultimately, you cannot negotiate with the climate and say, Lord, make me chaste, but please, Lord, not yet. We have three times more fossil fuel than we can afford to burn. We need to stop going looking for more of the stuff. And we need to take the subsidies and tax breaks away from that industry so that we can put them into the industries of the future. This is about doing less of the bad stuff, not just more of the good stuff. OK, and you all have uh, one minute each, and I'm going to uh, uh, cut you off if you go way over this. 
but you're going to give you one minute each to say why folk should vote for your party in two weeks time first of all Morris Golden why should people vote for the Scottish Conservative and Unionists we want to rebuild Scotland our manifesto uh, proposes a whole series of policies that will see an extra 200,000 jobs be created in Scotland. That's going to be critical for our recovery. We have business friendly policies which include a 25% minimum reduction in business rates next financial year as well as, well as a tapering beyond the small business bonus. We'd introduce a business advisory council to ensure that business is at the heart of all of decision making and all that is to help put an extra two billion pounds into our NHS, to secure an extra 3,000 uh, teachers to be brought in, to name just uh, a couple of examples and all of this while being the only party that has the sustainable policies to develop a circular economy and ensure that the climate crisis is actually tackled. And that was exactly 53 seconds. Well done that man. Daniel Johnson, why should people vote for the Scottish Labour Party? You know, what we're supposed to do at this point is say why we've got the best ideas and everyone else's ideas are rubbish. And I'm not going to do that. I agree with Kate Forbes. We have to invest if we're going to recover. I agree with Maurice Golden. We have to work with businesses, not against them. I agree with Patrick that we have to put a transition absolutely at the top of how we approach the recovery. And ultimately, I agree with Katie that we have to put recovery first. And that's what Scottish Labour are seeking to do to put recovery first, to focus on what unites us, not what, what divides us, because we need a better government. We need a better opposition. Scotland needs better politics. And that's why Scottish Labour are focusing on recovery, focusing on what unites us, because that's what recovery demands. Thank you very much indeed. Katie Gordon, why should there be a vote for the Scottish Liberal Democrats in two weeks' time? So business needs greater certainty to face the future and we will put recovery first. Our plans on education and mental health will help make sure we've got a workforce equipped to the challenge. We'll be building up new green industries with major infrastructure investment from government. We take special care to give the regions of Scotland that are heavily invested in fossil fuels a fair transition to new industries. We'd support growing businesses and help them with their cash flow during recovery. We'll provide a tax break for high street shops to help them survive and compete online. We won't risk destroying trade with the rest of the UK and we will keep close ties with our European neighbours for the benefit of business. We need the next government to have a needle sharp focus on recovery, not distractions. We want to get on with the job and repair the damage of the last 14 years to our education, health service, climate and jobs. Scottish Liberal Democrats will put recovery first. Okay, and uh, Kate Forbes will make the pitch for voting SNP in two weeks' time. Cabinet Secretary. Thanks. Well, I think all of us would agree that we've been through a tough year, but there is hope on the horizon. And with that hope, we face choices about the kind of economic recovery we want to see. If anything matters, it's leadership. And leadership has never mattered so much. Competent, experienced leadership. The kind of leadership that has steered us through one of the toughest years in living memory. But recovery has got to be a national endeavour. Government working with businesses to create and protect jobs. Our commitments are fourfold. One, get the economy open and trading safely. Secondly, create and protect jobs through guaranteeing young people a job or a training opportunity and investing in skills. Thirdly, investing in infrastructure, including delivering 100,000 affordable homes and boosting annual infrastructure. And lastly, ensuring we are globally competitive on the sectors of growth, renewables and tech being two obvious ones. We've got choices. Those choices are for the people of Scotland to make. Leadership will matter and so does a strong partnership with the job creators. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And the final pitch, Patrick Harvey of the Scottish Green Party. Patrick. Thank you. Obviously, I want to persuade you that the Greens have a strong track record of pushing the SNP beyond their comfort zone sometimes. Uh, we always focus on putting forward constructive ideas rather than scoring cheap political points. And I, I hope that's the kind of uh, inter-party uh, kind of uh, collegiate uh, and, and constructive politics that, that most people want to see from the political parties in a time of crisis. But others have said that what business needs is, is security and stability. I'm not here to pretend to you 
that security and stability uh, is attainable right now. We're in a time of profound challenge and change. I'm speaking to you from Dumbarton Road in Partick and just five minutes along the bike lane from, from here, the world's eyes are going to be focused uh, on the COP, uh, the, the climate conference, which I hope will still be taking place in Glasgow later this year. We know that the future is not going to be like the past, not just because of COVID, but because of the much bigger climate and nature emergency. So we need to embrace the possibility of change. We need to embrace the fact that uncertainty opens up possibilities for a better, fairer, more equal uh, and more sustainable society. I think that possibility is there for the taking uh, if we if we only have the political courage to do so. And that, yes, does mean also asking people in Scotland whether they wish to be an independent member of the European Union uh, or remain part of Boris's Brexit Britain. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, thank you to Morris for joining us today. Thank to everybody who's been following us on Twitter. But uh, for some closing remarks, I would now like to invite Tracy Black, the CBI Scotland director, to close this hustings. Tracy. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you found the last hour and a half both interesting and insightful. Throughout this election campaign, CBI Scotland has been determined to push the economy as far up the political agenda as possible. So it's fantastic to have had 90 minutes where it has been firmly at the centre of the debate. I want to say a huge thank you to our five candidates for allowing us to do that. I know the demands there will be on your time right now, and we really appreciate you joining us today. Best of luck to you all over what I'm sure will be a hectic final two weeks of the campaign. We look forward to working with you all in the months and years ahead to tackle some of the challenges we've spoken about today and to ensure everyone can benefit from a strong economy. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Bernard. It's brilliant to have such an experienced and well-respected chair keeping everyone in line and to Scottish Power for partnering with us. A lot of hard work has gone on behind the scenes, so a special mention to Keith's team for making it happen. Over the last few weeks, CBI Scotland has been running a series of events focused on the key economic issues that should be at the centre of the political debate in the run up to the 6th of May. Many of you will have also seen our business manifesto, which contains 30 key recommendations and dozens of other positive actions government and business can take together, covering everything from skills to net zero to business rates and the planning system. But above all, the manifesto and all our pre-election events have had three key messages for all political parties. Firstly, this election must be about rebuilding Scotland from the devastating impact of the pandemic. And it's vital that the economy is at the centre of the political debate in the run up to the 6th of May and beyond. Secondly, none of the major challenges Scotland faces from rebuilding the economy to tackling the climate emergency, to reskilling our workforce for the jobs of the future can be met by government or business alone. All parties should make business a genuine policy partner and ensure we work more effectively together to tackle the challenges Scotland faces. And last but not least, the pandemic has shown the value of business to be more than economic. From retail to restaurants, businesses are fundamental to our way of life and people's jobs are about more than paying the bills. They create social connections, support good mental health and provide a sense of purpose. So we're asking all parties to make the positive case for the role responsible businesses play in society. Finally, I want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. We had hundreds of businesses sign up and submit questions, which is fantastic. That shows the level of interest and enthusiasm there is for engaging in the political debate and ensuring that business and the economy is a key part of it. And we look forward to continuing to work with all of you after the election. Thank you.